podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Yes. Okay, good morning. I'm very grateful and honored to be able to give this, uh, <coughs> this talk in the opening session. I have been hesitating until yesterday night about the title. I was even tempted to put the title, which is in the program, opening, opening talk number two. Finally, I decided for this one because I suddenly realized that uh, we are uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of, a, of the paper by GGRT. I hope everybody knows what the initial stand for, and this is when the dual, mysterious dual resonance model of the late 60s, early 70s became a respectable theory, became string theory, and uh, unfortunately, as it gained respectability, it uh, was soon after abandoned. Abandoned, I mean, as a theory of strong interactions in favor of QCD. And we heard from John that uh, there was a very interesting reinterpretation of it. So I will also, oh, by the way, I take the opportunity to publicize this book that came out a few months ago by Cambridge University Press, which uh, concerns, in fact, the early days of, of string theory, the birth of string theory. There are contributions by John and myself and by many others and some very nice uh, introductory um, chapters by the editors themselves. So um, I will also limit myself to two topics and without any consultation with John, uh, we were sure a priori that there would not be the same two topics. And as you will see, in fact, one of my topics is not string theoretic at all. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So uh, the first topic has to do with some lessons we can possibly draw from uh, two success stories. These two success stories and from their puzzles and problems, the two success stories are uh, concern what we may call the standard model of nature as it has been updated on July 4th this year. Uh, on one hand, a gauge theory with a light Higgs for electroweak and strong interactions, and general relativity with a small lambda for gravity. Of course, we don't quite know yet whether the light Higgs is really the standard model Higgs. It, it looks like, but okay, as you know, one has to check many things before before claiming that that has been proven. In the same way, uh, we don't quite know whether uh, lambda is really, uh, dark energy is really a cosmological constant or something slightly more complicated. And this very successful model, you know, can be written down in, in one page, which is a remarkable achievement of our field. Uh, most of this could have been written 40 years ago, or almost 40 years ago. Uh, there are, of course, some new entries, this uh, dark energy component, neutrino masses, and maybe by now, uh, even this line, the Higgs sector, has been confirmed. Now, I remind you that the standard model of elementary particles has been very widely tested in accelerator experiments. And I want to emphasize that it is a quantum relativistic theory allowing real and virtual particle productions. And there is no way to find agreement between theory and experiments unless you take all these quantum radiative corrections into account. John Iliopoulos just a couple of days ago was making the remark to me that three level standard model is off by 20 sigmas or something like this. Okay, something incredibly bad. And so I just flash very rapidly. Oh, yeah, just to remind you that it is really taking into account these uh, radiative corrections that gave the first indications in favor of a light Higgs because the precision test at LEP uh, point out to have a good fit to a light Higgs. The first run, 2011, 
uh, at, at LHC excluded already, uh, you know, limited the possibilities to this very small window and finally uh, in the 2012 data, uh, both experiments have seen a peak which uh, at this famous five sigma level indicates that the, there is a, uh, a boson and you know, production cross-section, decay, branching ratio seem to be for the moment quite consistent with the standard Higgs. Now, on the other hand, we have also a standard model of gravity and, um, you know, of which we have formidable tests. The universality of free fall, for instance, is the uh, gravitational analog of G minus 2. Is, is, it has been tested to incredibly high precision. There are also uh, <clears throat> one per mil or, so, or better test of general relativity corrections to Newtonian gravity. The new predictions of general relativity, like the existence of black holes, the existence of gravitational waves, have also been tested. Well, this is just to remind of the <coughs> enormous progress we made since Galileo about the <coughs> universality of free fall. This is the, some evidence that there is a black hole in the <coughs> center of the Milky Way and these are this very nice test of um, gravitational radiation through uh, binary stars. Um, you know we have many experimental data for instance in this binary pulsar uh, as a function of the two masses of the two companion uh, um, uh, stars. Uh, uh, we can plot several observables. There are seven of them, and the fact that they all cross around the same point in this plane indicates that uh, GR is correct. Now, I want to emphasize that all these are tests of classical general relativity. We also have, by now, a standard model of cosmology, sometimes referred to as the concordance model. I remind you of the way inflation fits through some parameters, of course, but fits beautifully the CMD data uh, and that the position of the peak favors a specially flat universe. Uh, and I want to emphasize that the standard model of elementary particle and the one of gravity are nicely combined in inflationary cosmology. And, uh, emphasize that semi-classical quantization of the geometry itself is part of the game which explains the large-scale structure of the universe in inflationary scenarios. These are uh, fits which indicate that although omega total should be near one, uh, cold dark matter can only account for something like 0.27, so this is indirect evidence for something on top. And this is the famous diagram indicating cosmic acceleration and the need for, for vacuum energy. So I take advantage of this to publicize a, a little paper I put recently on the net. This is what I have been mostly doing recently. So this has to do with the question that this evidence for dark energy is based, of course, on using the Friedman Robertson Walker uh, cosmology, homogeneous and isotropic. The universe is not homogeneous. And the question has been coming up whether the existence of inhomogeneities in the universe could explain away the acceleration without need to dark energy. So we took this suggestion quite seriously and a group of people, we have re-examined this famous luminosity distance versus redshift relation, which is the way you see acceleration through the supernovae. And uh, we did that by using some gauge invariant light cone averaging in the presence of the stochastic inhomogeneities that inflation predicts. And we found that uh, the calculation is insensitive to infrared or ultraviolet possible divergences and no such divergences uh, which are encountered in other 
more formal ways of performing the average. And the bottom line is that the effect, although much larger than naively expected, if you say the gravitational potential in order 10 to the minus 5, and these effects are quadratic, you could have expected really miserable 10 to the minus 10. Actually, it's much bigger, but it's still too small to mimic a sizable omega lambda. However, these effects could be relevant for the precise determination of omega lambda of z in case of okay, the z dependence of the dark energy. I skip this more technical transparencies. We introduce some special adapted coordinates to do our averaging. And this is basically the, the result where you see what I, I'm saying. This black curve is what we get as an effect of inhomogeneities on top of the dotted curve, which is just lambda CDM in a, in a, uh, in a isotropic, homogeneous isotropic model. And you, the two, there, there, is, there is some Doppler effect a small redshift, but as you go to the large redshift region where you see acceleration, you really see no effect. On the other hand, what you see here in this band is the effect is some dispersion that you get because of the inhomogeneities, and that could prevent perhaps the determination of omega lambda to a better than 1% because that effect, as you can see, can easily simulate a change in lambda, although it's a, it's a dispersion. Right? It's not a prediction of a, of a jump in one direction or another. And in fact, the data show quite a bit of dispersion. So closing the parenthesis on my own work. So if we put all together, we get this famous cosmic concordance plot where the three sets of data agree on giving a cosmic fluid composition, pi, in which you have 73% of dark energy, 23% of dark matter, and the, and the rest is ordinary, uh, ordinary stuff. So this is already strong evidence that our standard model of nature cannot be the full story. But what have we learned from the successes and the puzzles? One lesson, in my opinion, is that nature likes somehow massless spin one and spin two particles. And as we learned through the years, this is why it is well described by theories with either gauge or diff invariance, OK? You can say that the mere existence of massless spinning particles and the consistency of their mutual interactions forces upon you this kind of theories. But there are many phenomenological puzzles for which we find hardly any clues from presently accessible length or energy scales, as, as John was already hinting at uh, at the end. I have a long list. You know this. We have heard them many, many times. I think there is no reason for me to dwell on that, uh, hierarchy problems, and uh, why three families, why the hierarchy, and so on and so forth. And there are similar puzzles in gravitational and cosmology. Uh, for instance, the nature of dark matter, the nature of dark energy, and uh, the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, the singularity issues, and so on. I want rather to emphasize what strikes me as missing quantum corrections. Uh, as I said, radiative corrections have been seen, are very important in, in getting precision tests of the standard model. However, they have been seen, quote unquote, in uh, marginal and irrelevant operators. For instance, the running of gauge couplings have been seen. Anomalous dimensions have been seen. Anomalies in global symmetries solving, for instance, the U1 problem have been seen. You have seen effective four Fermi interactions coming from boxes and so on, the neutral K system. Now, however, some relevant the corrections to some relevant operators have not been seen, and I refer here simply to the Higgs mass, which should get big radiative correction, uh, cosmological constant, which 
maybe even 120 orders off. Now, and I want to emphasize something which is trivially known, that the latter, the relevant operators, are sensitive to short distance physics, while the former are insensitive. And so this, in my opinion, tells us that the standard model and GR cannot be the full story, cannot be the full story. You need somehow something that uh, uh, tells you what happens at, at short distances. And uh, I don't need to remind to this audience that the standard model of nature is limping. There are two legs, one is classical, one is quantum. And in my opinion, two reasons for which GR should be elevated to a full quantum theory are the ubiquitous singularities of classical general relativity, which we would like to understand, and the quantum origin of large-scale structure the, the, that uh, you know, is the mechanism through which inflation provides uh, structure in the universe. Uh, so, to summarize, the standard model of nature's puzzles and problems appear, in my opinion, to be related to our ignorance about short distance physics. And I think that insisting on the, and, and, and sorry, I want to remind you that insisting on a better ultraviolet behavior has paid off already when one went from Fermi's theory of the weak interactions to the, to the standard model. So, wanted an intelligent UV completion. And one possibility that Susie is lurking uh, there, it's certainly appealing for, some, for solving some of the problems, the hierarchy, to provide a candidate for dark matter, would improve grand unification, and it will certainly be explored uh, at LHC up to some energy scale and we'll have to wait and see. And of course, even more ambitious is whether this, uh, this completion is provided by quantum string theory, which provides certainly a, a UV completion with a scale of its own, provides very nicely the massless particles that the standard model needs, the gauge bosons and the, and the graviton, Plus, unfortunately, more, a bunch of scalars, of moduli, which, in my opinion, are the Achilles heel of, of string theory, okay? Because they provide long-range forces which violate, if they are massless, they provide long-range forces which, uh, which uh, violate the equivalence principle, which have been tested so well, the universality of free fall. Now, it unifies gravity with other forces, even more with ADS-CFT reduces gravity to other, uh, uh, other forces, other interactions. It sheds light on quantum black holes, statistical mechanic interpretation of uh, the, the black hole entropy, and also to the ADS-CFT correspondence uh, on the preservation of, uh, of unitary evolution. And in fact, the second part of my talk will be about that kind of subject. Namely, I would like to uh, summarize a little bit what I have been doing for quite some time on two Gedanken experiments for exploring quantum string gravity. What am I doing with time? Still fine. So, the first is trans Planckian energy string string collisions in flat space time. This is some work I started with Amati and Ciafaloni in 87 and has been going on for so long. It will only be an executive summary, so don't worry. So, just a little bit of a picture. This is an example. We are supposed to resum loop diagrams uh, in the limit in the trans Planckian energy limit of, uh, of superstring collisions. And so this is just an example to show you the kind of physics we are trying to extract. So the color code is that in red you have the incoming and outgoing closed strings. In green you have the <coughs> exchanged 
closed strings, which are essentially at high energy regiaized gravitons. And in yellow, you have the strings you produce. For instance, in here, you can, def you can excite the initial massless string into something uh, heavy. Uh, here, this big yellow string is some formation of a very massive closed string in the S channel. Now, uh, on classical consideration, you expect some kind of phase diagram for this process in the plane in which you have the impact parameter of the collision and on the horizontal axis you have the energy of the collision which you convert into a, a radius, a Schwarzschild radius corresponding to the center of mass energy. And you expect these three interesting regions with quite different behavior and perhaps a critical line separating a region where you classically expect gravitational collapse from the other region where you expect the initial state to fly off to, to infinity, classically. Now, this looked to us from the start an ideal lab for studying several conceptual issues arising from the interplay of quantum mechanics and gravity within a fully consistent framework provided by superstring theory. Indeed, in the weak gravity regime, which is region one in the previous graph, big impact parameters, we can reproduce classical expectations like the gravitational deflection, tidal effects from the emerging geometry, and this is all done within a unitarity preserving semi-classical description. Then <clears throat> one can go to the region which was on the bottom left of the previous slide in which string size effects dominate, the string length can be taken to be much bigger than the Schwarzschild radius by playing with the string coupling. And there we found no evidence indeed as expected for black hole formation, even if we went to impact parameters smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. Rather, we noticed a fast growth of multiplicity. I'll give some formula in a moment. And a corresponding softening of the final state, which started to resemble Hawking radiation. Uh, as one moves to R bigger than L string, then this should smoothly evolve into a black hole evaporation like regime, but unfortunately it, it is not very easy to study. Some approximation fail completely there. So uh, on the other hand, we approach the problem um, in this limit in which we neglected string string effects, and their successes are still limited. Uh, amusingly, a drastic approximation of the dynamics, which we introduced in 2007, appeared to reproduce at the semi-quantitative semi level the expectations based on classical collapse criteria. And a general pattern seems to emerge where the sharp transition between dispersive and collapse phases is smoothed out uh, by quantum mechanics. Now, uh, there are many issues which remain unsettled. Uh, for instance, the saturation of unitarity in this regime is far from obvious, and this could be due either to our drastic approximations or and or to our lack of understanding of the black hole singularity. Maybe you do need string theory in order to solve this singularity issue. And here we had neglected in this part string effects. So we turned recently, or I turned recently to an easier problem, which is the high energy collision of strings on a stack of brains. So this would be the last subject of my talk. So um, basically this is illustrated here. Let's represent a stack of and P brains by this, by this line. And then on a plane transverse to the stack, we have an incoming closed strings which impinges on the brains at some impact parameter B. And then, well, something happens. It's either deflected or it can be absorbed by, by the brain system. This is another picture 
of the process. Here you have the incoming string, which uh, goes in and out, and then this is a gravy region or closed strings exchange in the C channel, and the process can also produce open strings whose ends are attached to the D brains. So there can be a conversion of the kinetic energy of the incoming closed string conversion into the ma a very massive open string. Now, we start, okay, this is a, an example of a one loop uh, collision in which you see the same thing, but now again, like in the, like in the string string scattering case, the initial closed string can get excited, so there can be a tidal excitation of the initial string. You can also see here that by rewriting the diagram this way, that now what you can have in the S channel is the conversion of the initial energy into two open strings attached to, to the brain system. And you can go on, and of course at n loops you'll get the possibility of forming n open strings attached. So we try to study this process. Here the expectations are similar to the previous ones, uh, but the word collapse is replaced by the word capture. So whether the, the incoming string is captured. And um, at the disk and annulus level, uh, an effective classical brain geometry emerges through, again, the deflection formula which are satisfied at the subtle point of the B integral. We have to resum an infinite number of diagrams. You get this uh, iconal uh, exponentiation and then, uh, and then, as I said, we can reproduce classical expectations. Uh, don't mind about this formula. This is just to point out that, of course, in this case, uh, the role of the Schwarzschild radius is played by the radius of the brain geometry, which doesn't depend, of course, on the energy of the incoming probe. And this is basically the reason why the problem is, is much simpler here. Uh, we also compute the tidal effects to leading order in R over B and uh, string length over B. They come out in complete agreement with what one obtains by quantizing the string in the D-brain metric. Uh, this tidal excitation spectrum has also been double-checked in other papers by Will Black and Christina Monni. Massimo Bianchi, who I think is here, and uh, Paolo Teresi have also computed some of these processes at the one-loop level. We, and that's why we are a little bit stuck, we are still finding some discrepancy between the scattering amplitude calculation, which is done in flat space time, and the uh, string propagation in the deep brain metric. We, we find that uh, some, excite, some tidal excitations look different in the two calculations. I look forward to discussing with Eva Silverstein, because I think she has considered a similar problem recently. This only occurs at subleading order in the deflection angle. At leading order, there is perfect agreement, and we are still very puzzled by this. And it's, if we overcome this problem, I think extension to the uh, classical capture regime should be possible and would allow to understand how quantum coherence is preserved through the production of a coherent multi-open string state living on the brains. We, don't, we are not in the presence of a black hole here because these are extremal configuration, but, um, but still how the, uh, uh, the initial quantum state preserved its coherence through the production of many, many multi-open string states is a similar problem to the one of how coherence is preserved when you form a black hole and that evaporates. Last but not least, for P equals three, for three P, P brains, this Gedanken experiment should give some information on the ADS-CFT correspondence within an S-matrix framework uh, because 
uh, we are in an asymptotically flat space-time, so we can really construct the initial and final state at infinity uh, according to s matrix theory. And the last transparency, I want to say the preliminary uh, results about what we expect and how we can compare string string and string brain scattering when we go to this interesting regime in which impact parameter and Schwarzschild radius or the geometry radius are smaller than the string scale. Now, as I said already, uh, in the string-string um, uh, collision case, we find a fast growth of the number of closed produced strings. You see this goes like E square because the Schwarzschild radius to the power d minus 3 is an hour power of E. And uh, so if you share equally the incoming energy among so many produced closed strings, you get an average energy which is the string scale divided by this ratio. Now, since we are in the regime L string uh, bigger than R, this is still a large energy in uh, string units. However, as you move, try to extrapolate to R bigger than L string, this would give only massless string modes which hopefully go over into some Hawking-like radiation. However, the approximations that we use to, the, to, to obtain these results cannot be trusted precisely in that regime. So, in string brain scattering, the situation looks to be easier, uh, and the analog results are that the number of open strings that you form should scale in this way, but I remind you now, RP is just the radius of the geometry produced by, by the brain system, so it doesn't depend on the energy itself. So, uh, the average open string energy, again, in string units, scales like LS over RP, and when you write it down in terms of G string and N, is something which can now be sent to zero if you go to large enough G N. And so, we hope that the calculation will be done, will be reliable even in that regime, and this is where we hope to make contact with the CFT living on the brains. And I guess that this is it. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Yeah, one. A question about your general part of the talk, Gabriele. You mentioned that moduli are the Achilles heel mm -hmm. of string theory. Uh, how do we know, since we don't know what supersymmetry breaking will do to them? No, I mean, our, no, I didn't say it's a killer, otherwise, we would not be here. <laughs> I mean, they are a potential killer. Achilles heel. Yeah, I mean, the, the weak, I, I don't know, I, I used it in the sense that it's the, the, the tricky part. Of, you know, this is many times when I give general talks to strings, there is a standard question which I will never get from this audience, you know. I mean, how can you prove string theory? So, I make the following, uh, I give the following answer. String theory at the three level is ruled out. So, uh, the fact that we cannot prove or disprove string theory comes from our inability to go beyond three level, beyond even perturbation theory. Uh, because if you take it at, at, at face value, there is a dilaton. We know the coupling of the dilaton and uh, and it uh, and, and just doesn't work. I mean, we always say uh, string theory gives general relativity. No, it doesn't give general relativity. It gives the brans dicke theory, right? So, uh, and the brans dicke theory is ruled out with the parameters of string theory. So, 
is, uh, so what I meant to say is that we have a moduli stabilization problem to be solved. Now, I agree with you. I mean, we are all here to see how it can be solved once you understand how supersymmetry is broken and so on. So, um, this is what I meant. Any questions, comments? You know, you know if I can add something, uh, it is not true that you have necessarily to go to Planckian energy to, to test string theory. And to make a parallel with the old string theory, it is true that the old string theory was uh, abandoned in favor of QCD because of short distance experiment and scaling and things like this, but also because it had this massless raw, as, as, as John was saying. And to have a massless raw was wrong at, at, at low energy, not at high energy. So there were both low energy and high energy reasons to to reject the old, the, old, uh, the old string theory. And I think the same can apply in principle to super string theory. Uh, we have to be careful that we don't get contradictions at low energy, at large distances, as well as at short.